2nd of June 2010, on a glorious summer's day in a beautiful, rural, friendly part of the UK, 13 people were killed in the space of a few hours. All 13 victims were killed with firearms spread over a 20-mile stretch of the coastal region of Cumbria, starting near Whitehaven, then travelling southward towards Seascale. I have visited Cumbria four times now, carrying out my own independent investigations into these events, and I've spoken to many first-hand witnesses who saw what took place. I've also looked at the small amount of CCTV evidence available, and I probably now know more about these events than anyone other than those who have seen the official police files. This film will present my findings of these investigations, and it is intended to show that the case needs to be reinvestigated, because this film will demonstrate that it is not clear exactly who was responsible for all of these murders. Many questions still need to be answered. I am happy for people to send me their own evidence, and I am happy to be corrected on information put forward in this film, as long as that evidence is well founded, and not an attempt to divert from the truth. According to the mainstream media, and according to the verdict of an official inquest, all of these murders were carried out by one single gunman, acting completely independently. He was 52-year-old taxi driver Derek Bird. At this point, those of you familiar with this case might be listening to what I am saying in absolute disbelief. If you are, I would like to ask you to consider these questions. What evidence have you personally seen that proves to you that Derek Bird killed all 12 of the victims? Have you seen conclusive proof derived from each of the 24 separate shooting locations that show it was Derek Bird acting alone who fired every single bullet? If you have seen such proof, then please say what it is out loud now. I can help you out with these questions. The only evidence available in the public domain is a handful of media statements from witnesses who say they knew Derek Bird and say they saw Derek Bird in Whitehaven at just three of the 24 locations where bullets were fired. At the remaining 21 locations where bullets were fired, all of which were outside Whitehaven, people described seeing a gunman. But none of these witnesses knew Derek Bird, and none gave detailed facial descriptions of what the gunman looked like to the media. From speaking to many of these witnesses, I have discovered that not only did they not describe the gunman in their media statements, but they were not asked by the police to describe the gunman's facial features in their police witness statements either. It seems that because a small handful of witnesses who knew Derek Bird claimed they saw Derek Bird in Whitehaven at three out of the 24 shooting locations, it was assumed that the gunman must therefore have been Derek Bird at the remaining 21 locations. We cannot assume that Derek Bird was present at the remaining 21 locations if no witnesses described what the gunman looked like. History tells us there is often a lot more to lone gunman incidents than what is immediately apparent, and we must not fall into the trap of making gross assumptions if we are going to get to the truth. As I mentioned, three of the 24 shooting locations were situated in the busy town of Whitehaven, and two of these locations were captured on CCTV. But why have I not been able to find any images which clearly show Derek Bird with a gun in his hand in Whitehaven? or anywhere else that day. I repeat, I cannot find a single clear image in the public domain showing Derek Bird with a gun in his hand. Now that I have explained that not enough evidence has been made available to the public to demonstrate what happened, I am going to take you on a journey which explains my findings about this mystery and in doing so highlight the many questions which still remain that could point to something entirely different to the official story. The golden rule about finding the truth in any investigation is to ask the right questions, but most importantly, in the right order. This might seem obvious, but almost everyone has fallen into the trap of not doing this in the Cumbria Massacre case. The questions which should be answered strictly in this order are what happened, how did it happen, who was responsible, and why did they do it? The schoolboy howler error that most have fallen into with this case is to jump to the fourth question before they have even addressed the first question. 
This isn't surprising because mainstream media have been attempting to explain why the alleged perpetrator carried out these murders from day one, before any detailed investigation was carried out. But more on mainstream media later. The most common motive that people will automatically quote you in this case is that Derek Bird was up to his eyes in debt. This is completely untrue. It was revealed at the official inquest that Bird had £22,000 in savings and did not owe the inland revenue a penny, as people have claimed. His net earnings were around £6,000 a year and he was therefore on tax credits and not liable for any income tax, nor were the inland revenue chasing him for any income tax. Looking at motives before you have established what happened is destined to give you the wrong answer. So I will tackle motives much later in the film, after I've examined evidence. Before I go into detail on that evidence, there are some important points that everyone should know about past lone gunman incidents. There are dozens of lone gunman cases, and many have turned out to be more complex than immediately reported. Let's mention just three high-profile shooting incidents that were initially reported as lone gunman assassinations. The JFK assassination, the Bobby Kennedy assassination, and the John Lennon assassination. I advise you carry out your own research, but I would argue that in all these cases, the gunmen were in fact patsies. A patsy is a person who is easily taken advantage of, especially by being cheated or blamed for something. The real perpetrators responsible for the murders in these cases were most likely not the person who was charged. They were manipulated through various means to be at the right place at the right time with the gun in their hand. In both Kennedy assassinations it is now reasonably well established that neither of these gunmen fired the shots which actually killed the victims. This is not conspiracy theory, it has been established by evidence-based research. In his book who killed John Lennon, Frenton Bresler presents evidence that the former Beatles' death was not the work of a lone nut, but that Mark David Chapman was a CIA asset, and that the CIA itself, or a faction within it, was behind the assassination of John Lennon. Mark Chapman is the other the famous case. He was literally in a trance state when the police arrested him. He was here, and John Lennon appears to have been hit by from bullets from the other side. So in, in, in that case, I believe that Mark Chapman was too a patsy that was um, just basically, his, his job was to stand there and play the role of the, um, of the aggressor. Sirhan Sirhan, the alleged killer of Bobby Kennedy, was said to have been in a trance-like state during and after the shooting. Later, Sirhan would state strongly that he did not actually remember anything that happened during the shooting. But everyone said he did it, so he must have done it. Well, I mean, he was, he was examined by some very, very prominent uh, hypnotists afterwards, and they all um, concluded that he was actually in a hypnotic trance when, when he, uh, during the assassination attempts. I mean, other clues were the fact that there were 14 bullet holes, and he, his gun only actually held uh, eight bullets. What the suggestion is, is that more recently he's sort of had remembrances, and he thought that he was, he was at a shooting range, so he was actually going through something quite mundane lifted his gun and thought he was shooting at a target. The suggestion is that actually his gun actually only held blanks and he was like the distraction, uh, like a sort of, like a fishing lure or something like, you're looking over here and then the actual, uh, I believe in the Kennedy assassination, the actual gunman was stood directly behind him. Control of a patsy using hypnosis is a tool that is alleged to have been used in lone gunman incidents on many occasions. George Estabrooks, for one, basically said that I can hypnotise any man and I can, within the space of a very short time, commit, uh, make him commit treason, murder or suicide uh, and create the, the scenario whereby he will not even know that he's been hypnotised. J.G. Watkins, in a very, very short time, hypnotised soldiers to attack superior officers, believing them to be enemy agents. Before we look at the events of the 2nd of June 2010, we'll get some background into the kind of person Derek Bird was from people who knew him. He was a quiet person, but um, a nice guy. He's a nice guy, he's a pleasant guy. He had a very, very nice temperament and he was always very, very charming. From a decent family and in a decent and, and very beautiful neighbourhood. A family man. You know, if you had a, a child, Derek, can you just look after this 
me wee last for an hour because I've got a crisis, yeah? Yeah. He wouldn't have even thought twice about it. He's not violent, he's not overly aggressive. He was a reasonable lad who went about his business apparently in the right way. And, you know, once you got to know him, you, you could have a laugh and a joke. I've spent many a time um, at motocross meetings with him, you know, like socialising as you do, you know, having a drink after the race meetings and having a laugh and a joke about what's happened. A week previous, David and his brother Derek were up at the local scramble track with a, an off-road vehicle that David had just finished making. And they spent quite a bit of time that afternoon driving round and round, laughing their heads off, like you would expect warm brothers to do. There wasn't any underlying reason. Somebody said, oh, it's Derek Bird. It's a taxi driver. And I said, oh, no, we know the lad. Surely he hasn't been shot. And then they said, no, I think it's him that's done the shootings. And I said, oh, never. So, so were you surprised when you found out it, w it was him that had supposedly done these shootings then? Absolutely gobsmacked. He, right. Out of character. You can't believe what's happened. Let's now describe the official story, which most people probably accept as truth, with the help of Channel 4's documentary on the case, which did not uncover a single anomaly with the police investigation and did not seek to ask any probing questions about what really happened. It just reported the official story, as is always the case with mainstream TV. He drove three miles east to the village of Lampla with a .22 rifle and a silencer. He knew access to his brother's home would be easy. What had driven Derek Bird to kill his twin brother, David? At 10 o'clock, Derek Bird set off to kill his brother's solicitor. At 10.20, Derek Bird shot dead Kevin Commons. Gunshots were heard and reported to the police. Into the busy town centre of Whitehaven. Two really loud bangs. Seeing there was a guy on the floor lying down over there, on the floor, just behind the, the bins now. Bird's first target is Darren Rucastle. Taxi driver Don Reed is shot in the back. Heading away from the rank, Bird pulls over when he recognises another taxi driver, Paul Wilson. There's Bird in his car, so I've basically walked over, I've ducked down to look in the car and bang, shot me straight away. The three unarmed police officers chase Bird for a quarter of a mile. Then they witness his fourth shooting in Whitehaven. I just seen the two barrels coming out the window and as I turned, I just heard a bang. The taxi driver didn't know he'd been hit till he turned around and looked at me. And then I took my jacket off, I looked and I was like, oh my God, I've been hit myself. Bird speeds off through the market town of Egremont. Got into the car, uh, closed the door and just drove off down the hill into Egremont. It was only when I looked back up the hill that I saw the, uh, there was his body slumped on the floor. Susan Hughes, Kenneth Fishburne, he is shot dead just yards from his home. A few hundred yards further on, Derek Bird sees Les Hunter. And as I crouched down further, he fired the other barrel and right in the middle of my back. Bird heads south out of Egremont and next sees 15-year-old Ashley Glaister. I uh, ducked down and then that's when he shot and I thought it would go past my hair. Just walk along the verge of the road and he just pulled up and shot him. 65-year-old Spike Dixon. Derek Bird reaches Wilton. He then shoots the next people he sees. Jennifer Jackson and her husband, James. By now, Derek Bird is back on the main road. About 11.20, he sees a man trimming this hedge. Gary Purdom was 31 and a father of two. But Derek Bird will kill three more people in the next 15 minutes. The first is Jamie Clark, shot dead driving along in his smart car. Bird continues into sea scale. Harry Berger has been hit in the shoulder. He is very badly injured, but is still alive. 26 seconds after Bird's Picasso has passed the CCTV camera, there are two more gunshots. Bird has shot dead Michael Pike. Moments after the death of Michael Pike, Bird kills Jane Robinson, shot yards from the home she shared with her twin sister. On a two-mile stretch of road, there will be six more shooting incidents. Bird has shot at a campsite. He injures four more people in separate random shootings. His tire came off up there and he stopped there. Derek Bird has abandoned his taxi. And then he'd gone down the lane and into the wood and shot himself. I mentioned witnesses earlier and we've seen a few already. From my research, of the 24 shooting locations, there were around 90 first-hand witnesses. 
Of these, I have been able to find 59 of them mentioned in mainstream media. I have had personal contact with 36 witnesses. Of these, 26 have given me information about what they saw. From my own witness accounts and from what has appeared in the mainstream media, I have ascertained that only 36 witnesses actually saw a gunman. And of these, 24 described the gunman in some way or other. Of these, 16 indicated that they thought it probably was Derek Bird. Out of all the witnesses I have spoken to, the person who looked at the gunman's face for the longest period was witness Jill Culshaw, who was near the scene in sea scale of the 11th victim, Michael Pike. She states that the gunman was staring at her for between 30 seconds and a minute. Here is her statement. So, that was so, on the news. Right. That the picture of the man, it looked nothing like what I thought that right. I'd seen, if so that makes sense. Jill can, can, Jill can ask that question on, on here and just record you saying that. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so I'm with... Um, it's on my police statement. It, it's on your police statement, isn't that? Well, that's, that's quite interesting. I'm with Jill Colshaw, and just tell us description of the vehicle and the, the, the person in the car. It was a Citroen. Uh, Picasso. It was either a light green or light bluey colour, one of those weird Citroen colours. I'd seen him approaching the back wheel of uh, Mike's car with the left hand wing, uh, front wing, uh -huh. very, very slowly and thought, what on earth is he doing, as right. you would do? Right. <laughs> and then I heard two noises. I didn't even know there was um, shotgun at the time. Right. It was just two really loud bangs. Then it seemed like 30 seconds a minute, stirring at us, and then, phew, off he went. So he stared at you for 30 seconds at least? At least, yeah. Right. So you got a good look at him? Yeah. I I've got two pictures of, of Derek Bird here. Yeah. Because um, obviously um, what you've said contradicts the picture. It, it does, yeah. Right. The person that I thought that I'd saw was probably late 20s and black spiky hair. What was the length of the hair? Um, probably inch and a half, right. spiked up. Okay. Short dark hair spiked up in his late twenties. That's hardly a description of Derek Bird, who had sandy hair receding and was 52. In the very first police report posted on the Cumbria Police website at 11am, we also have a description of a younger man. The police website read, Police are currently searching for a dark grey silver Citroen Picasso driven by a man in his 30s with a shaven head believed to be involved. This statement was also read out on BBC Radio. Armed police are looking for a man said to be in his 30s with a shaven head driving a dark grey or silver Citroen Picasso. Interestingly, the Channel 4 documentary also used the same radio clip. Here it is, exactly as it appears in their documentary. Armed police are looking for a man with a shaven head driving a dark grey or silver Citroen Picasso. But hang on, let's play the original clip again. Armed police are looking for a man said to be in his 30s with a shaven head driving a dark grey or silver Citroen Picasso. And now the Channel 4 version. Armed police are looking for a man with a shaven head driving a dark grey or silver Citroen Picasso. So not only do we have two descriptions of a much younger man, but we see that mainstream television are withholding this from their documentary. The age being reported as in his 30s is close to what Jill Culshaw said in his late 20s. Having discovered that a younger male may have been involved in these shootings, I wanted to get hold of the official inquest papers, which contain statements from all the witnesses. These statements might shed more light on whether a younger man was involved. In order to do this, I wrote to the coroner to request information and statements from the inquest, which I thought would be publicly available. After all, an inquest is open to the public. The coroner's office emailed me, asking why I needed the information. I told them it was for a documentary, which is seeking to give an accurate account of the events, therefore we need the inquest papers to be sure of our facts. The coroner, David Roberts, emailed me, asking for further details about the documentary, such as who had commissioned it and which channel would it be aired on. I answered all of his questions, and after this he then refused to give me any information, stating... Having considered the matter and the issues involved, 
I do not consider that you are a proper person within the meaning of Regulation 27. In the circumstances, I am not in a position to provide you with the documents you have requested. It seems my documentary hasn't been commissioned by the right organisation to warrant being given access to the inquest papers. Despite this, I set about carrying out further investigation and tried to track down witnesses myself. As you can imagine, this is not something you do lightly. Contacting witnesses who have seen people murdered with a firearm and asking them for statements is often met with refusal to cooperate. Don't you do when they talk about it? It has to be done with tact and patience. I've come back to Cumbria to try and speak to some more of the Cumbria shooting witnesses because as far as I'm concerned there is a huge question mark over the description of the gunman and also the description of the gunman's vehicle. If you read mainstream media it was Derek Bird in a, a Citroen Picasso taxi and that's the end of it. But I have highlighted several anomalies in the evidence which suggests there may have been uh, at least one other gunman uh, who was described as being in his 20s with short dark hair. There are at least 52 witnesses that I've identified. I've got their addresses here. So I'm interested to know from these witnesses what did the gunman look like uh, and what vehicle was he in. All of the pink numbers on here represent uh, witnesses and where they live, the 52 that I've managed to identify. So we've got, um, we've got a couple of witnesses who live in Kendall there. Uh, I've already knocked on the door of witness number 50, but uh, he wasn't in. We've got witnesses in uh, Ulverston, a couple there. I'm gonna go to those next. And coming up, we've got obviously a lot of witnesses in C scale where three people were killed. As I say, a lot of those witnesses haven't spoken or have not given statements to the media. And then coming up, the other major place uh, was Egremont. Got a number of witnesses there and obviously uh, Whitehaven. So these are all witnesses, some of whom have spoken, some haven't. Get on the way to Overston. After much perseverance, I managed to gather a significant number of testimonies and recorded a few interviews which we will look at in detail. I have identified 24 locations where a gun was fired, but of these there is only a tiny amount of CCTV evidence that has been made available. So let's look at CCTV evidence first and then come on to the witnesses after that. We have this piece of CCTV, which is alleged to be Derek Bird travelling south on the B5086 through Frisington just after 5am. Derek Bird lived in Rora and would regularly travel this road from his house to get to Whitehaven for taxi jobs. Usually after this mini roundabout, he would turn right along the B5294 heading for Whitehaven. People have suggested this image is evidence that Bird was staking out his second alleged victim, Kevin Commons, who lived in Frisington at Mowbray Farm. But Bird would travel this route every time he went to and from Whitehaven. So the CCTV image could just be proof that he was carrying out his normal taxi driving activities. I suspect the reason this clip has been released is because it shows his car within a few hundred yards of the turnoff for Mowbray Farm. He is alleged to have gone to Mowbray Farm five hours later just after 10 a.m. along this road to kill Kevin Commons and there are no eyewitnesses who identified Derek Bird at that second murder. There is an eyewitness to Bird driving along the Mowbray Farm lane at around 5 a.m. which some have tried to put down to him staking out his victim. However, Bird had a meeting arranged with Kevin Commons for later that day so it is possible he was just dropping off paperwork at his house prior to their meeting. The other CCTV evidence released is mainly filmed in Whitehaven. Before we look at it, I will explain the gunman's alleged route. He is alleged to have driven down Duke Street, stopped his car here at the beginning of the taxi rank, shot and killed Darren Rawcastle out of the passenger window, firing twice with a shotgun, then moved his car several feet further forward toward the other end of the rank, jumped out of the car leaving his vehicle in the road, pursued another victim on foot, fellow taxi driver Don Reed, who he shot with a rifle at point-blank range in the back, leaving him on the pavement. He then got back into the car and drove around the town centre one-way system and then back down Duke Street for a second time, this time stopping momentarily at the taxi rank to fire two shots out of the passenger window into a wall, luckily missing any people. He then sped off to another part of Whitehaven. So let's look at some CCTV of this. 
This piece of CCTV shows the gunman passing the taxi rank at some point before passing the rank for the final time. This may be immediately after the first shooting, or it could be from some time earlier. We're not exactly sure when this clip is from. It is claimed to show Derek Bird with a gun. I would argue the image is not clear enough to be able to conclusively identify who it is, nor that there is a gun. This piece of CCTV shows the gunman's vehicle driving around the one-way system, presumably between the two incidents on Duke Street. And this video is the only CCTV available filmed when bullets are being fired. It is filmed from a different angle at the far west end of the street during the second approach down Duke Street. We see the gunman's car pull up here and then people react to the shots fired out of the window into the wall. On this occasion the gunman does not get out of the vehicle. If we were to view CCTV from this camera angle just three minutes earlier we would see the gunman's vehicle pull up here, the gunman get out of the vehicle with a gun and pursue Don Reed up the street. However, CCTV from this camera has not been released for that time frame. In fact, there is no footage I've been able to find showing the gunman in the street in Whitehaven wielding a gun. This news article states, images recorded by a surveillance camera are understood to show in high definition the exact moment Bird pumps bullets into the head of his 43-year-old colleague. The footage is so horrific it can never be shown to the public, say police. The camera, located directly opposite the taxi rank in the centre of Whitehaven, Cumbria, first focuses in on Bird as he beckons unsuspecting Mr. Rowcastle towards him. Then footage in full colour shows Bird exploding with rage as he blasts Mr. Rowcastle before turning his gun on Don Reed, said a source. The source is not named. The article goes on. Last night, Cumbria Police confirmed the Duke Street incident was captured by a 360-degree dome-style camera monitored by council staff at a dedicated central headquarters operation room. It also feeds live pictures into the control centre at Whitehaven Police Station. Both civilian operators and their police counterparts have the ability to move the camera and pan in on events, usually minor street disorders and public drunkenness. I am very suspicious about the accuracy of this article. Firstly, it says the camera focuses in on Bird as he beckons unsuspecting Mr. Rowcastle. Remember, no shots had been fired in Whitehaven at this point. Bird was not even a suspect. Why would the camera focus in on Bird just because he beckoned over a colleague? It then says Bird exploding with rage as he blasts Mr. Rowcastle. This is completely inconsistent with all of the other shootings where Bird was not in a rage. Remember, the gunman was sitting inside the car when he shot Rowcastle. Would a CCTV camera really pick up somebody exploding with rage inside their vehicle? Like I said, there appears to be no clear images available to the public showing Derek Bird with a gun in his hand. If police have high definition images from CCTV in Whitehaven, why haven't we seen them? Why have we not been given images of the gunman getting out of his car? Which according to this article must exist we would then be able to make some judgment, independent of what witnesses have claimed, as to the identity of the gunman. But so far, we rely wholly on eyewitnesses. The argument for the withholding of this CCTV is because of the sensitive nature of the images. This is a lame excuse, because we are not asking for images of any victims, only the gunman. Victims could easily be removed. And secondly, here is an image put out in our media of David Rathband, who was shot by Raoul Mote just one month later. It seems the media and police only release images when it fits their agenda and not for the public benefit. Another anomaly to draw attention to is that in the image of the gunman's car passing the rank from the side, the vehicle appears to have a yellow sign on the roof. In none of the other images do we see a taxi sign on top of the car, including the one at 5am. Perhaps the gunman removed the taxi sign shortly before the assaults on the taxi rank. There are no eyewitnesses in Whitehaven to him removing the taxi sign from the roof. Could this point to a second vehicle being involved? Or could these images have been filmed on a previous day perhaps? We see no car at the front of the rank in this image, as would normally be the case at 10.30 on a weekday. Tuesday morning, you can see there, time is 10.37. The taxis move up in turn. 
I don't completely rule out a second Citroen Picasso, but out of all the witnesses I have so far spoken to, none of them remember seeing a taxi sign being on the roof of the gunman's vehicle that day. Because so little CCTV has been made available, we the public rely purely on what witnesses claim to have seen, which we will look at later. The CCTV from Duke Street continues on after the shooting and shows a member of the public, Paul Goodwin, in a black Ford Escort following the gunman's vehicle. He stops his car to allow a police officer to get in, then continues chasing the murderer. The gunman's car is then picked up on Scotch Street, where it pulls over at some traffic lights, stops momentarily when the driver then allegedly beckons taxi driver Paul Wilson, who was walking up the street. Wilson puts his head to the passenger window and is allegedly shot with a shotgun at point-blank range, but survives with just a scratch. We then see the car pull away, followed by Paul Goodwin and a police van. We see the vehicles again on another camera shortly after this. Almost an hour later, after killing a further seven people, we see a very brief clip of the gunman's car captured 15 miles away at sea scale by a private CCTV system. And that just about sums up the total amount of CCTV evidence I've been able to find, which in itself proves almost nothing about who carried out these murders. We saw how one of the CCTV clips appeared to show a taxi sign on top of the vehicle, whereas in others, no taxi sign is present. I have no eyewitnesses of the vehicle having a taxi sign on it during the day in question. Interestingly, this mainstream media clip taken from a helicopter after Derek Bird was killed seems to show a vehicle with a taxi sign on the roof. Could there have been two or more silver Citroen Picassos involved in these shootings, and therefore more than one gunman? Let's now look at some of my own investigation which concerns witness accounts at the 24 locations where bullets were fired. We'll go through all 24 shooting locations in the order they occurred, reporting on what is alleged to have happened, how many witnesses, what they saw and how many people were injured or killed. At each location I will quote media reports from the most significant witnesses and also quotes from witnesses I have spoken to personally. Location 1, Lampler. Derek Bird's brother's house, 5 a.m. One dead, zero injured, zero witnesses. Nobody saw nor heard a thing with this murder, and I am not aware of any evidence which places Derek Bird at the crime scene. Location 2, Mowbray Farm, Frisington, home of solicitor Kevin Commons, 10.13 a.m. Only one witness to this murder, Susan Rooney, who was situated over 150 metres away from what happened, therefore she did not see the gunman close enough to be able to recognise him. While hanging out washing, she heard a bang and then phoned the police. Pan round. You can see the road going up there to the farmhouse. There's no way anyone would identify what's unlikely at that distance. Here is a summary of what she said in her phone call. She heard an air rifle shot and said a fella's got out of a car and ran up the farm lonning and he's shooting. She explained that there were two men, and that she was frightened one of them is wounded. She then explains that somebody in a Picasso, grey-blue in colour, with taxi written on the side in yellow, has left the scene. So at this point we still have nobody recognising Derek Bird after the first two murders. Location 3, Duke Street, Whitehaven, 10.30am. One dead, one injured, eleven witnesses. Let's look at the testimony first of Barbara Tingey, who worked at the sandwich shop immediately in front of where Darren Rowcastle was murdered. In this transcript of her police telephone call, she states, A taxi pulled up at the rank, in the taxi rank, and, I don't know, it was just a rifle. He had the window down, a rifle, and he shot Darren twice. He moved on, and I didn't see what happened after that. She is then asked whose taxi it is, to which she replies, I don't know, but it was a biggish man with thinning hair. I don't know whose taxi it was. She is then asked if anyone at the scene recognises the male that has fired the shots. She replies, I never recognised this man in the taxi. Did you, Joan? The call ends without the police identifying the gunman. I have spoken to Barbara personally, and she told me that she did not know Derek Bird, but knew him by sight, as he occasionally came into the sandwich shop. 
I suspect when she said this, she meant that after seeing his face on television, she then realised that this is the person who occasionally came into the shop. In her phone call to the police, she states, I never recognised this man in the taxi, suggesting that she did not recognise the gunman at the time of the shooting as a man who occasionally came into her shop. After the gunman killed Darren Rowcastle, he got out of his car and shot Don Reed. I looked up and I saw Derek Baird approach the taxi rank, shouts to Darren, Darren, here I want you. Derek Baird then lifts up his shotgun and then he shot Darren in the face. Then he sort of leaned up like that, went bang again. And then as he did that, he shot his quarter panel out on his Citroen Picasso. I was shouting, no Derek, why Derek, why? All the time, he never spoke a word to me. He just looked at me and he just had a, it was just a plain look. He just turned round and I thought, get for cover. And I just dived, literally. I had no direction of which way I was going. I was just going down. And in my back, I realised he'd shot me. I then got down to where Dad and Rowcastle was lying and I thought I'd apply first aid. And then when I looked at Dad's face, Dad was gone. And then I turned around and looked behind me and there's Derek Baird uh, just walking towards me with the shotgun. And then somebody shouted and then he jumped in his car and he drove off. Another alleged witness to the Duke Street shootings was ex-military man Darren Williamson, who was probably the most prominent witness featured in Channel 4's documentary. From this interview, it seems Darren Williamson witnessed more than some of the other witnesses, but strangely, I couldn't find any mention of him as an inquest witness. According to the paperwork I have, his testimony was not featured at the inquest. This makes me ask the question, was he a genuine witness? Another fellow taxi driver who previously went on holiday with Derek Bird and witnessed the Duke Street shootings was Richard Webster. Mr Webster, a taxi driver of 15 years, was in his car at the rank when he heard a bang, which he mistook for a car backfiring. He then saw Mr Reed run past his taxi before seeing Bird's taxi drive from the road at the back of the rank towards the front where it stopped. He said, Don dived between two cars. Derek got out of his car, had a gun in his hand. He ran from the middle of the road to the top of the rank round the pavement. Mr Webster described Mr Reed running like Linford Christie as he tried to escape his pursuer. He was on the floor, he said. He'd done a roll and he got up and started running as fast as I have ever seen anybody run. Staying in his car, Mr Webster watched Bird, who he described as a nice fella, ran back to his taxi carrying a gun with black sights and a silencer on the end. He said, I saw Derek running back towards his car in the middle of the road, so I opened my door and shouted at him. He had the gun and was eyeing Donup with his sights. I couldn't believe what he was doing. I shouted out, Birdie, what the hell are you doing? He was wide-eyed, just wide and starey, and he was smiling at me. When people were wrestling Sirhan Sirhan to the ground, he was described as being uh, completely calm and tranquil and even having a slight smile on his face. And he was smiling at me. He just stopped what he was doing, looked at me, dropped his gun, looked at me again, got in his taxi and drove away. So, very interesting remarks there. Wide-eyed, just wide and starey, which sounds remarkably like being in a trance. More comments from witnesses similar to this later in the film. I telephoned Richard Webster, but he told me that he doesn't really talk about it anymore and tries to keep out of it. I asked if he got a view of the gunman's face, to which he replied, no I didn't. I then asked him if he saw the gunman's car, and again he said he didn't. Another Duke Street witness, David Simpson, also refused to speak to me about what he saw. Sidney Coyles witnessed both the Duke Street shootings and said, it was strange, as Bird never said a word. There was no shouting. He just kept the gun locked in his shoulder and appeared calm, raising the telescopic sight to his eye. Again, could this suggest some kind of mind control or hypnosis? There are a number of Duke Street witnesses that I have not been able to make contact with. But let's now come on to the incredible account of witness Paul Goodwin, who was described as a hero in mainstream media. He was featured in Panorama's documentary about the shootings and also agreed to take part in an interview for this film. But before we see that, I'll explain with the aid of a map of Whitehaven exactly what Goodwin is alleged to have seen and done. Goodwin was parked on Duke Street, not far from the gunman's vehicle immediately before the shooting started. After the first two shootings took place and the gunman sped off, Goodwin followed him all the way around the one-way system. 
he followed him down Duke Street on the second pass of the taxi rank, passing the dead body of Darren Rowcastle and all the commotion going on at the rank. He witnessed the gunman shoot again. After the gunman sped off, he then continued following the gunman. He then picked up a police officer in his car here and then drove around the corner and then witnessed the shooting of Paul Wilson. When the gunman sped off yet again, he continued following for another half a mile to Coach Road, where the gunman shoots two more victims. He then follows the gunman's path out of Whitehaven, but chooses to take a different route when he reaches this junction. So let's hear about this in his own words. Um, I was travelling up Duke Street, and just as I got past where the taxi rank starts, I heard uh, a bang at the time. I'd, I've never even heard a gun go off before, but at the time I, I knew straight away that was a gun. Um, as I pulled up towards the junction outside the music shop on the end, I turned round and I could see this, this car pull up, this taxi pull up beside me and the guy got out with um, a, a, a massive, a, a big gun and um, ran across Duke Street and to where the Shaker's wine bar is on the corner mm -hmm. and then ran down the street with uh, aim at his gun at somebody on the street. Mm -hmm. um, I pulled off the main road onto the side, onto the side and uh, got my phone and phoned the police and uh, told them that you know, there's somebody running yeah. loose with a gun. Um, they asked, they were asked, obviously asking the details where I was at and what, whereabouts, you know, what was happening. And then he, Bird got back in his taxi and um, set off back up the road and he pulled in front of my car and he was literally five foot away. Right. But he was just looking straight right. ahead, but I could see the guns on the, on the seat. Right. And can you describe him? In your own words, what uh, the description? He just, he, just, he just looked very calm. I mean, I, I only saw the side profile of his face, so... Right. But um, he just looked very calm. He, he wasn't. He didn't right. seem agitated or, or so flustered or anything. Ask you what age you thought he looked like? Well, I, I would have thought at the time. I thought uh, uh, late forties, early fifties. Right. Did you know Derek Bird at all? No, I didn't know him until we were watching the on telly and they named him. Because what I'm trying to do is to get out of your head any anything that you've seen on TV thus far, okay, mm -hmm. or anything. Just your own your mm -hmm. own recollection yeah. of what the gunman looked like. Mm -hmm. Did you get? A, did you see the colour of the hair? Yeah, it's like a sandy colour hair. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. You you would say it would it would fit the descriptions of what you then. Saw but I was saying later on, yeah. What you then saw later. Yeah. On. Okay. So I, I started following him. I was still on the phone to the police, really, and you know the, the, the type of car it was, the index number, um, and just informed them where he was going. So I followed him down uh, Queen Street and onto Lowther Street, and then back up Strand Street, and he came onto Duke Street a second time. And when he went round the first time, okay. Mm -hmm. did, did you have sight of the vehicle all the way around yep. until he yep. came back? Yep. I was right behind him. Right, all the way around and then... In fact, the only time I was about three cars behind, when he, when he pulled off Queen Street onto Lowther Street, uh -huh. which is the, the other main street, the yeah. parallel with Duke Street, I was like three cars behind, but by the time we got round to the traffic lights, they come back onto Duke Street, I was right behind him again. Right. There's no way that vehicles could have been switched there. And then this may be a different vehicle the second no, time round. No, no, no way, no, you didn't. I, I also had eye, eyesight of, of, even though I was two or three cars behind, right. I could still see where he was at. Uh, right. And as he was going up Duke Street again, there was obviously loads of people, people come out the shops and, and, and whatever, and offices, and there was people standing on the curbsides. And as he got to where it, um, he'd fired the first shot, I could see um, the young lad lying, lying on the floor that had been shot. Um, as he was coming past the second time, he slowed down again as he was going past the rank and was firing the gun out the window as he was driving past again. Mm. Um, and then he, he set off to up Duke Street. So I followed him up Duke Street. And then when we got to the top of Duke Street, there's a pub called The Ship, and the road bears round to the right-hand side towards where the police station is. Mm. Uh, there was lots of police running down towards the town centre at that point. Mm. And I spotted uh, the local Bobby, Mike Taylor. Um, so I pulled over to the, side, to the side of the road, and I said to me, to get in the car, it's that guy in the taxi, he's got a shotgun, he's, he's just shooting at people. I said, he's, he shot a taxi driver. Let's move on to location four. Scotch Street, Whitehaven, 10.34am. Zero dead, one injured, three witnesses. And there's a guy walking around the corner, and he sort of put his head down to the to Bird's car, and then his head went back, and Bird took off. So as we pulled up to the corner, I could see the guy, was a guy called Paul Wilson, he used to be my taxi driver every Friday night, and um, I could see a blood on the side of his face. Um, at that point, there was policemen when coming out the police station to attend to him. Um, we went in pursuit of, of, of Bird. Well, I've come around the corner. Um, we're on Scott Street now. Uh, police station's up in front of us, up the top of the road there. Um, basically, my name is this. Uh, got my documents to do. I got to be about here and uh, heard my name being shouted. 
I've looked over and there's Birdie in his car. So I've basically walked over, I've ducked down to look in the car and bang, shot me straight away. Um, didn't know it at the time, but gust of air across my face and, uh, you know, I've been shot and most of the pellets have ended in the wall behind me. And a gentleman comes up to me and he says, are you all right, mate? And he grabs me by the shoulders. And he says, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. It's just a mate of mine shooting blanks. Just been a duff with you. You know, I'm all right. Don't worry about me. He says, no, mate. He's bloody shot, yeah. I managed to speak to one of the Scotch Street witnesses, Robert McLaughlin, seen here in the CCTV clip running to help Paul Wilson. I was walking down into town, crossing Scotch Street. And as I was crossing Scotch Street, when usually there was no traffic in the street, it was clear. And I noticed the car turning out of Duke Street into Scotch Street, and I thought I had plenty of time to get across. I walked across the road, turned left to go down to Lalder Street, and next thing I saw a car, a Citroen, I think it was a Citroen, silver-coloured Citroen, pulling sort of 45 degrees to the corner. Um, and the th thing I noticed about it was the, the broken glass. It was, I think there was a windscreen, a, a quarter light, uh, and a chap was bending down as though he was giving instructions. And there was a big, terrific bang, and the chap staggered backwards, holding his neck, and the car proceeded off to the left. I turned around, went back, and assisted the, the chap, and I noticed all his neck was um, pop-marked and, uh, and bleeding. And then the police arrived on the scene and moved us all out of, told us to move on, go somewhere secure. There was a... Just to clear this up, how many people were in the vehicle? I just appeared to be the driver. And you, you got a, a very slight glimpse of him. Just w what was your impression? He's, he's, he's just the back of his head. He looked, uh, could he be, uh, he looked uh, a fairly biggish chap. That's all I could say. Could and, you say uh, fair or dark? Or? Right, I couldn't really say. Right. So Robert did not see the gunman's face, but did see that the quarter panel glass on the passenger side had been broken. Before we move on to the next location, it is worthy of note here that Don Reed was shot at point-blank range in the back with a rifle and Paul Wilson at point-blank range in the face with a shotgun. Their injuries seem a little insubstantial when one considers what happened. Could this be significant? Don Reed is the guy who got shot in the back. D did you see him at all? They, we were, they were treating him in the, in the Brooks's. Yes, right. they were treating him in the back and the back and his le left-hand left side back. I think it was all peppered. And uh, the, the medical people treating him there, yeah. Location 5, Coach Road, Whitehaven, 10.35 a.m. Zero dead, two injured, eight witnesses. Uh, about 150 yards down Coach Road, um, the police car come to a stop and we heard a bang. And then we saw a taxi, the taxi driver had um, pulled up at the side of the road. Uh, Mick got out the taxi, there was a young lass screaming at the side of the road, that there was, they just got out of the taxi. Witness Belinda McCourt spoke to the News and Star. She said, I was out walking the dog talking to a neighbour when I heard the gunshot. I thought it was someone shooting pigeons. I saw the man do a three-point turn on Coach Road outside the school. He had a gun that looked like a rifle pointing out of the window. His windscreen was smashed. He had been shooting out of the window and took off straight away. We heard screaming and realised what had happened. Although Belinda states the windscreen was smashed, she may have been referring to the quarter panel. I've just spoken to another witness, Belinda McCourt, who witnessed events at Coach Road. Now, she said that she does think the vehicle was a Picasso and it was a silvery colour and that the man driving it was 45 to 46 and probably was. She does think it was Derek Bird, uh, as described in news media. Uh, she said that the person uh, looked like he had evil in his eyes. The taxi driver didn't know he had been until he turned around and looked at me because all his blood and all his flesh was all over me. And then I just took my seatbelt off and just jumped out the taxi. Because as he had shot at us, this policeman was following him in a car. And he jumped out the car. And as soon as they say me taking my seatbelt off, he told me to jump out that taxi and run. Uh, Mick Taylor, the policeman, got out of my car and got the two people that were in the taxi, the driver and the passenger, took them into the churchyard to keep me safe, basically. Mm. Um, the police car was stopped in front of me, it seemed like an age, it was probably maybe 30, 40 seconds, and then they set off, and I could see at the top far end of Coates Road, which is probably eight, 900 metres away, I could see a bird's car going at speed up the hill, mm -hmm. out of Coates Road. The police went on the lower road, I went up the Woodhouse Hill. As I was setting off to go up the Woodhouse Hill, there was a LNG taxi coming down. Mm -hmm. 
So I flagged it down and um, I said to the, to the lass, get on the radio and let everybody, let the taxi drivers know there's a guy running around with a shotgun and he's, ta he's shooting taxi drivers, he's already shot too. I have come to refer to Paul Goodwin as the roaming witness. He followed the gunman's car for well over a mile and was present at three shooting locations during the attacks on five victims. He may well be a hero, but to me his actions seem a little odd. If these events were some kind of conspiracy, is it possible that the perpetrators needed a vehicle to track the gunman's vehicle for the duration of the events in Whitehaven, for whatever reason? Did, you, did it cross your mind, oh, I'm chasing a guy with a gun, um, I could be in danger here? Did you, you, nothing had, no, nothing had you just, saw, nothing you had just had, acting on I mean, it. the policeman, Mick Taylor, when we were stuck the, stuck the traffic lights, he said he's reloading his gun, and you could see him re reloading the gun again. Right. And uh, it didn't even it didn't even register. I mean, Mickey just said, kept saying, just hang back, don't get too close. He did, just he just somewhat like switched on, and you just right. try and try and do what you can, like it. Right. The next witnesses, Jeffrey and Alison Doran, saw the gunman in his car fleeing the scene after the Coach Road incident. A news report said that he, Jeffrey, saw Bird with a gun sticking out of his grey Citroen Picasso taxi on the Gins to Kells Road. Bird overtook cars despite approaching a blind bend. He said Doran lost sight of the taxi at a T-junction as Bird turned towards St. Bees in Egremont. I've just spoken to Geoffrey Doran, who was with his wife Alison Doran, and they were they witnessed the coach road events. They didn't uh, see him fire his gun, but they saw him. He said he was holding his gun in his right hand out of the window, holding the steering wheel with his left hand. Uh, he said that he did get a glimpse of him, and he did think it was the person who he'd seen on TV. Um, and interestingly, it, he said that he thought that there was decals down the side of the car, indicating that it was a taxi, and he did think it was a taxi. He said it was a, a silvery grey colour. His wife, apparently, sh she thought that it wasn't a taxi. So they, they, they bought, one thought it was a taxi, the other one didn't. So that indicates how people can miss things like that. Before finally leaving Whitehaven, the gunman pulled over and tried to talk to another member of the public, Jacqueline Williamson, and asked her for the time. She said, As I walked across checking my watch, I noticed he was holding a gun with both hands, with one on the trigger. He was looking directly at me. His eyes were staring. I will never forget that. I thought at first he was going to shoot the dog, but then I thought he was going to shoot me. I gave him the time and then I thought, This is it. He's going to shoot me. She said at that moment the dog pulled on the lead away from the car and she walked away in the opposite direction. She said she feared being shot in the back but eventually Bird drove on. We see here another reference to staring eyes. His eyes were staring, I will never forget that. The next shooting took place 20 minutes later. Location 6, Haggard End Close, Egremont, 10.55am. One dead, zero injured, eight witnesses. At this location, the gunman got out of his car and shot victim Susan Hughes twice in the stomach with a rifle. The News and Star reported, The inquest heard from Cleto Moorman David Bell, who was travelling through Egremont en route to Seaskill with his wife and seven-year-old son, when they had an obstructed view of Bird manhandling an injured Mrs Hughes on the pavement. He said, I saw the taxi with its driver door wide open and we slowed down because it was tight to get round. I saw a man and a woman with his arm around her neck and shoulder. All his weight was on her. Both were standing and she was looking at me with her hand stretched out to me. I thought at the time that she was the taxi driver and that she was helping an elderly passenger into his house and was asking me for assistance. It was as if she was struggling to help him up. Mr Bell said he looked back but his view was obstructed by the car. Unaware that there was something seriously wrong, he travelled on to sea scale where he realised the magnitude of what he had seen. Again, we see no actual description of the gunman and witnesses not even realising something had happened. I also spoke to Audrey Rogers, who lives right next to the place where it happened. OK, I've just knocked on another witness's door, Audrey Rogers, um, who, was, uh, well, who was listed as being a witness at Haggard End and uh, she said that she didn't see anything at all, she didn't see any, any vehicles. Uh, she said the police came, but she didn't see anything. Barry Moss, who was featured in Channel 4's documentary, told the Daily Mirror, When I got past, I saw a short, fat guy looking up the hill, and I thought, that's got to be the taxi driver. I turned round and briefly got a look at his face, and there was no expression. But my eyes were drawn to a massive telescopic sight sniper rifle. 
It just looked like something out of a James Bond movie. My thought was that it was a prop or something. He stared at me, probably not for very long, but seems longer now. He scurried into the car and drove down the hill. It was only when he had driven off that I saw a body slumped on the pavement. Again we have a comment about the gunman's lack of expression, and again, no detailed description, just that he was short and fat. I also spoke to witness Jeanette Henderson, who said she had counselling and did not feel well enough to testify at the inquest, but told me she thought the man she saw matched the images of Derek Bird shown in the media. Location 7, Bridge End, Egremont, 10.56am. One dead, zero injured, three witnesses. I have spoken to two of the three witnesses. The first, Ruth Hartley, who told the News and Star, I heard an almighty crack and I knew it couldn't be a car backfiring because they don't do that anymore. Mrs Hartley told the inquest, I ran back and saw Ken was bleeding profusely. I checked for signs of life, but I thought he wasn't with us anymore. Ruth told me that she did not see the gunman nor the vehicle, even though she was close to where the gun was fired. I then spoke to soldier Russell Elliott, who was the first person on the scene. Right, I've just spoken to Russell Elliott, who was a witness at Egremont. Now, he said that he was the first person there um, to attend to one of the victims, and he said that he didn't see the gunman's face. Now, the other thing that Russell Elliott said was that he didn't think it was a taxi, so no taxi sign on top of the vehicle at Egremont. Location 8, Vale View, Egremont, 10.57 a.m. Zero dead, one injured, two witnesses. Leslie Hunter was featured in Channel 4's documentary and survived being shot in the back with a shotgun. Car pulls up and just says, can I see you a minute, mate? So I said, ah, no problem. So I stepped off the curb to go towards him and as I did, I looked in the car and I seen a shotgun lying across the passenger seat. And he started to lift the gun up. Well, I knew something was wrong then. I just turned away as quick as I could and he fired one shot, which went past me head, and it just a burner sensation, pellets hit me in the face, they're held up a bit now, and uh, it was a loud bang, and they deafened me, and as I crouched down further, he fired the other barrel, and right in the middle of my back. He was as calm as anything. Again, he was as calm as anything. When I met Leslie Hunter, I showed him some photographs of Derek Bird, and he did think this was the man that shot him. But strangely, Leslie Hunter also insisted the vehicle was definitely not a taxi. Because I think every taxi has the same uh, decals along, along the side of the vehicle, so let's go.
Okay, it's now December 2014 and I've returned to Cumbria for a fourth time. I'm now in Kendal. Um, now what I've done, I've contacted all of the witnesses, so I've got about uh, 20 contacts that, haven't, uh, that I haven't managed to make contact with, so these are the last, the last witnesses that I've yet to try. Location 9, Thornhill, 10.58 a.m. Zero dead, zero injured, five witnesses. We now come on to one of the most puzzling parts of the events. I have spoken at length with two of the witnesses of the Thornhill incident. I have had a short statement from a third witness and I have also spoken to the mother of Ashley Glaister, the teenage girl who had the gun fired at her. None of these witnesses other than Ashley Glaister have been quoted in the media to my knowledge. I will explain the official version first with the help of a police document which describes the alleged route of the gunman. According to them, Bird drove out of Egremont on the main A595 turning south and heading towards Thornhill where he left the main road and drove into Thornhill Estate where he shot at Ashley Glaister on Thorny Road. From Thornhill, Bird turned right onto the A595 and then immediately left and began driving along partly surfaced single track country lanes past the village of Carlton. There is a huge question mark over this. Here is witness David Dalton who was driving along the same road as the gunman and was overtaken just before the Thornhill turn off. I pulled on round the roundabout onto the A595 heading south towards um, Seascale. Mm -hmm. I hadn't long cleared the roundabout, maybe 50 yards, 75 yards, uh, and I looked in my mirror and there was a car coming off the roundabout and he was in like the second lane, like the overtaken lane, mm -hmm. and he seemed as though he was in a bit of a hurry and I seen it was like a grey coloured car and as he come past me I noticed that the, it looked as though the side um, quarter uh, window was out. As the car passed it was going at speed and I thought to myself it looked like like a, a grey colour Citroen Picasso and it had the um, the plate on the back, the taxi plate as it overtook me it cut a couple of cars up and I say the cars breaking and I seen the, the what I thought was a Picasso breaking up I put my foot down and I, I thought what a clown were these cars in front of you? these yeah. cars were in front of me right. and I thought what a clown you know, he's in that much of an hurry, mm -hmm. um, and obviously was making the cars break up as they come in where the park head is. Because it goes from dual carriage to single to carriage. To single carriage. So where the chevrons were, he overtook, he went over the chevrons, cut the cars up and got in. By this time, um, I was maybe 50 yards behind them. I got to towards Thornhill, and the traffic was still coming towards Egremont. There was no car turning into Thornhill and there's no way a car could have turned into Thornhill with the floor traffic. Um, and obviously I didn't see the car t turn off anywhere. Mm -hmm. So when I got back to work, um, obviously there was all sorts of rumours going around the bench shootings and my, my ex-girlfriend phoned me up and she says, Dave, the, you know, there's somebody going around shooting and one thing or another around Whitehaven and this is when I got to know about it. And one of the lads says to me, later on in the day, here, yeah. do you know this morning when you said about this car overtaking you and the window being like the side, like, well, quarter window being out, he says, um, that could have been the, the car involved in these shootings. And I says, well, I don't know. He says, you better phone the police. Well, as the day went on, it got filtered out um, that it was Derek Bird. Mm -hmm. I says, bloody hell, I know Derek. And then things started falling into place. The car, taxi, and then obviously, you know, things like started falling into place. So I phoned the police up. Um, I explained to the police what had happened. And the police says, um, oh, thank you very much um, for the information. But um, we've had numerous calls um, and we don't think that you'll be needed. Yeah. And I says, well, to be honest, I said, I don't think the car, I said, there's rumours that the car turned into Thornhill, there was a shooting at Thornhill, this had been come out later on. I said, I don't think the car did pull into Thornhill, 
I said, I think the car pulled onto the mission road, pulled off to the left and went on the track. I said, because the flow of traffic, nobody would have been able to turn off into Thornhill. And they said, oh, thank you very much. If we need you, we'll, you know, we'll get back to you. Now, the other two witnesses I've spoken to who were independent are both listed in the inquest papers. They both saw what happened at Thornhill and both saw Ashley Glaster get fired at. One of these witnesses was about 15 yards from the vehicle and the other maybe three or four yards from the vehicle when shots were fired. Here is a statement I took from one of these witnesses. My attention was drawn to a vehicle which was driven at high speed into the street. I observed the vehicle being looped around in a 180 degree U-turn. After the U-turn the vehicle parked against the curb facing the opposite direction it had arrived. I then looked away from the vehicle. Shortly after this I heard a loud bang, what I thought was a car backfiring, followed by a second bang, which may have been an echo or probably a second shot. I then looked back at the car and saw Ashley with her hands to her head protecting herself and she ran off in a panic. The vehicle remained momentarily, then drove off at speed, at which point I lost sight of the vehicle. I then witnessed a bus braking heavily to avoid hitting the vehicle on the junction. I can state categorically the vehicle was maroon or red wine in colour, it had black and yellow taxi markings along the side and a taxi plate on the back. I asked this witness about the windows of the vehicle and they claimed that they were all intact. The other witness to this event, who was also very close, approximately three or four yards from the vehicle, also told me the vehicle was maroon coloured. Right, I've just spoken to Darren Powell who was a witness at Thornhill. His house is where the gunman pulled up right up outside it. And um, I said to him, I sent you a DVD when he, speak to me, he says, no, I don't really want to speak about it. He said, it's all been documented. And I said, well, could you give me the colour of the vehicle? And he said, it was a maroony colour. That was his word, maroony colour. And the vehicle was probably 12 feet from where he was. From, from from the door of his house. Um, now, he seemed confused because he said, he said, well, it's all documented, you know, we know who done it and all the rest of it. And uh, I said, well, we don't really because we've got conflicting accounts. Uh, so I pushed him on it and I asked him to describe the gunman. And it sounded to me like he was just going by what he's seen in the media rather than what he's seen with his eyes. He said late 40s. Um, but uh, he didn't say that he got a clear look at the gunman. Right. It was the vehicle in particular, he said it was a maroony colour. So that's two witnesses we've got saying the vehicle was maroon. So we have David Dalton saying he thought the silver Picasso did not turn into Thornhill. And we have two independent witnesses at Thornhill saying the vehicle that shot at Ashley Glaister was maroon coloured. One of these witnesses claims they know of another witness who was on the Thornhill bus and also claims the vehicle was maroon. And I got a phone call. Mr. Dalton, we think um, the information that you spoke about could be relevant. Right. Um, is there any chance that we could come um, and interview you? I said, yeah, no problem. So um, a lady come out and interviewed me, and she says, so what do you think happened after you seen this car? I said, well, I don't think for one minute that the car turned off into Thornhill. I said, I think it's turned off left, and it's gone onto the, um, the dirt track going up towards Carlton. Let's hear now from Ashley Glaster. I was coming down from the shop and he was coming like across this way to go up the corner when I was coming down and then that's when he pulled up beside me and he said something so but that's when I went over to the car and he said do you like something and I said turn on and said what to him and then he that was when he was pointing the gun at me and then I uh, ducked down and then that's when he shot and I felt it go past my hair and then I ran down to my sister's crying and he shot again while I was running down to my sister's. Frustratingly, she doesn't say what colour the car was, nor whether it had a broken window, and doesn't describe what the gunman looked like. I tried to speak to Ashley Glaister and went to her house. Right, I'm outside the house of Ashley Glaister. She's the young girl that was shot at um, in Thornhill. Now, um, so this is an important witness and um, obviously almost a victim, so I'm going to be sensitive here. And, um, yeah important thing is what colour was the car and what, what was the age of the gunman and what the gunman looked like if I can get that. Okay. Okay so I've just spoke to Ashley Glaster's mother. She says that Ashley's got a very good memory and she will know um, the colour of the vehicle and, and whether the windscreen was out. She seemed to think the windscreen wasn't out. I went back to the house the following day but her mother told me Ashley did not want to talk to me.
But there is yet another twist to this part of the story. In March 2011, during the inquest, Mail Online published two still CCTV images, allegedly taken by the bus CCTV camera at Thornhill. Seemingly the same bus that our witness saw braking heavily to avoid the gunman's vehicle. The images show a vehicle entering and then leaving the street where Ashley Glaster was fired at. According to the timestamp, they were taken just 43 seconds apart. The images clearly show a greyish Sitton Picasso. I showed these images to one of the witnesses who made the statements about the car being maroon, and they said this was impossible, and definitely not the car that shot at Ashley Glaister. The events at Thornhill occurred just before 11am, but the CCTV images from the bus show 11.35am, which is over half an hour later. The time the vehicle was in the street also seems very quick, just 43 seconds to get into the street, do a U-turn, park up, call over Ashley Glaister, fire two bullets and then drive away. I decided to drive the route to see how long it would take. So he's come down here, hopefully this time without the bin wagon. He's come down here, he's picked up now, he's driven down here, past the shop. And then he swung round at this junction. He's done a full U-turn, witnessed by our witness. And he's come round. And then he's pulled up by this house here, up here. He's then wound his window down as a, a girl's coming out the shop. So she's coming down, walk, walk, walk. And then she's appeared here, he's wound the window down. He said something to her, um, then bang, bang. Let's let's drive off almost straight away. So he's driven straight up here and the bus is supposedly still there at that bus stop there. And he's flew out of this junction and been picked up again. I think it is possible the images from the bus do not show the vehicle that shot at Ashley Glaister. If somebody was fabricating evidence, they had plenty of time to produce these CCTV images by the time the inquest took place. I have been told by one of the Thornhill witnesses that some of the investigating officers of the Thornhill event knew about a second vehicle being involved. Location 10, Carlton, 11.01 AM. One dead, zero injured, zero witnesses. Not much to say about this one. The victim's body was not even discovered until about half an hour after he was killed. Location 11, Wilton, 11.05 AM. One dead, zero injured, one witness. The only witness to this killing did not see the gunman. The Westmoreland Gazette stated the witness, Mrs Deborah Carey, saw the taxi pull away from her house and heard a bang when Mrs Jackson was shot, but thought it was the sound of a car door and did not notice her body. Location 12, Wilton, 11.06 am. One dead, one injured, two witnesses. The Daily Mirror reported, Christine Hunter Hall was blasted in the back by the maniac seconds after he murdered her neighbour Jimmy Jackson, 68. As she crashed to the ground and felt blood rise to her throat, she whispered to husband Stephen, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. Christine amazingly survived the random attack but has 100 pellets still lodged in her lung. Her terrifying experience was revealed yesterday at the inquests into the crazed cabbie's 12 victims. Speaking for the first time about her ordeal, Christine said, the taxi slowed down and I saw he had a gun. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I just thought it was a joke. He pointed his gun at Jimmy and saw the startled look on Jimmy's face and just shot him. It was then I realised it was real. I just froze. I couldn't run or move. Steve started shouting, get out of the way. I turned and that's when he shot me. Blood was pouring out of my mouth. I remember flying to the ground from the impact. I didn't just fall. I couldn't breathe because of all the blood. I didn't realise I had punctured my lung, that was why. So, no descriptions of the gunman here. Location 13, A595 Red Admiral, 11.21am. One dead, zero injured, five witnesses. Right, I've just spoken to Timothy Miles and his wife, and th they were on the uh, A595, I think around about the time he shot Gary Purdom. They didn't see any shooting, and they didn't see the gunman. Um, they said that they looked in their rearview mirror and they thought that the man was 
older than in his 20s. They, they, they said, yeah, it, it, they thought it might have been Derek Bird, but they couldn't confirm that they definitely saw his face or anything like that. But they felt that it was probably a slightly older man. Um, and they did say that they did not think that there was a taxi sign on top of the car, but they did see the taxi plate on the back of the car. The Westmoreland Gazette reported Daniel Harper spotted Bird standing in a firing position, holding a rifle with a scope on it, with the stock against his shoulder, taking aim at Mr. Purdom. When I looked, he was dropping down, Mr. Harper said. I could see someone in a boiler suit lying on the ground in the field. Bird blasted his victim a second time with the shotgun before running back to his taxi as Mr. Harper pulled his wagon over. I shouted, What's going on? What's he done to you? He just looked at us, jumped in the car and drove off. Michael Farron was working at the roadside on blocking drains when he came face to face with Bird as he drove slowly from the scene. I looked straight at him. I was only a foot away. I recognised him as a taxi driver from Whitehaven. We looked straight at each other. He looked straight through me. He did not look angry or agitated, just completely normal. Again, could these descriptions, he looked straight through me, be suggesting mind control? Another witness, Andrew Barnes, commented the taxi driver was so calm. Location 14, Sea Scale Approach, 11.25am. One dead, zero injured, zero witnesses. On this occasion, the gunman is alleged to have fired at the victim while he was driving the car, causing him to crash. But there are no witnesses who saw the gunman's face. Location 15, South Parade Sea Scale, 11.29am. Zero dead, one injured, ten witnesses. Harry Berger was shot while attempting to drive under this bridge. He told the Times newspaper, I could see it was a taxi and wasn't going to stop, so I reversed out of the tunnel, and as I did, I could see a shotgun sticking up by the side of his seat, leaning against the seat belt. Then he started fiddling with the gun and I thought, he's going to use it. I had started to put the window down to say, don't threaten me with that shotgun, when he fired. The first shot went through my wing mirror and exploded in my right hand, taking off my two fingers. I shouted, you've shot me you bastard, and he let rip again. He was right alongside me. He was puce in colour, anxious, nervous, sweating profusely. This description of the gunman is in stark contrast to previous witnesses, who described him as calm and staring. Although there were numerous witnesses at this shooting location, only one that I have identified other than the victim saw the gunman's face. Charles Whiteman, who was in a car behind Harry Berger, spoke to me on the phone. He said that when the first photograph of Derek Bird came on the news, he didn't recognise him. But later, when a second image was put out, he thought it did look like the man he saw. Charles Whiteman also stated that the windscreen was fully intact. Another thing that Whiteman pointed out in his telephone interview is the fact that the gunman shot Harry Berger left-handed, but he believed Bird was right-handed. Immediately after this shooting, the gunman's car is caught on this CCTV camera. We know the passenger side quarter panel window was broken in Whitehaven. If this clip showed an intact quarter panel, it would prove more than one vehicle was involved. It's very frustrating. Location 16, Drig Road North, Sea Scale, 11.30am. One dead, zero injured, six witnesses. One of the witnesses was Gillian Coolshaw, who I mentioned earlier. Let's just listen to what she said again. So, that so, was on the news. Right. That the picture of the man, it looked nothing like what I thought that right. I'd seen. It was a Citroen, a uh, Picasso, and then I heard two noises. I didn't even know there was a um, shotgun at the time. It right. was just two really loud bangs. Then it seemed like 30 seconds a minute stirring at us. The person that I thought that I'd saw was probably late 20s and black spiky hair. What was the length of the hair? Um, probably inch and a half, right. spiked up. Well she seems very very sure and she seems very very confused that what she remembers doesn't seem to add up with what the mainstream story is. From, from a lot of the witness statements that I've heard what it seems to be is that the, the human brain tends to like to fill in the gaps. You don't like to have any un, sort of finished threads and such like that. So if they've seen something and they're not made quite sense of it, there is a distinct possibility that what can happen is that later, when you see the image of Dave uh, Bird, then you appropriate that backwards and go, okay, yeah, no, that is. 
Her 10-year-old son also witnessed the Michael Pike shooting and was interviewed by the Daily Telegraph. Unfortunately, he was not asked to describe the gunman. I've just knocked on the door of another witness, Sandra Shand, who was a witness at Sea Scale, according to the official papers, uh, but she claims she didn't see anything at all. She denied all knowledge of it. Uh, she was asking who I was, uh, but she's not seen anything. And I think the body of Michael Pike was lying outside her house. The other witnesses at this location, who included John Reed and Sandra Shand, did not see the gunman. Location 17, Drig Road South, Sea Scale, 11.32 a.m. One dead, zero injured, four witnesses. I spoke to witnesses Stephen Martin and James Young. Neither of them saw the gunman. They both heard gunshots from their respective houses. Stephen Martin came out to attend the victim and saw the car driving away. James Young saw the car driving away from an upstairs window. He also stated that there was no taxi sign on the roof. The other two witnesses at this location also did not see the gunman. He's killed Michael Pike as he's been driving along the seafront and then on his way out of sea scale he's killed um, Jane Robinson, an elderly woman. Now Jane Robinson was the last person who died and I'm fairly sure now that there was no witness to the gunman of that event. So have they, has the operative stepped in at this point? Did Derek Bird get shot by uh, some operative who then jumped in and killed the last two victims? Location 18, Old Shore Road, Sea Scale, 11.36 a.m. Zero dead, one injured, one witness. I spoke to witness Barbara Cook, who did not see the gunman. I also attempted to contact the victim, Jacqueline Lewis. I'm now in Drig and I'm trying to locate one of the victims called Jackie Lewis, uh, a female pensioner. Uh, now, um, in trying to find her property, we asked a postman and the postman straight away said to us, are you journalists? And I said, no. And he said, well, um, don't go to her house because we, we gave the name. He asked for what he said, well, what name do you want? Uh, he said, don't go to the house, and then he said, there's a media block on her. All right, so, and then we drove off, and he repeated again, don't go to her house. So, it seems that the, um, the enforcers are employing postmen to prevent people from speaking to some of these witnesses. Um, now, I'd be interested to know why there's a media block on this woman. This woman was shot, uh, but and survived with head injuries. So we're just on the road near where she lives now. We haven't found the house, so we're just gonna drive a bit further up here and see if we can locate her. Morning. Let's speak to Jackie if that's possible. Please, to come in for you. I've right. had the postman already. I don't know what you want, but I suggest you move it before the police come for you. Okay. It's no, it's no problem if she doesn't want to speak to us. We just. Why would she? Did she ask you well, to come? No, we just. Did she just, ask you to come? Well, um, we'll go. It's no problem. We'll go. She wants us to go, so we'll go. What you don't know, car. Right, so the police, we've just pulled in here, and the police have, um, that's the police car there. So he, they either haven't seen us or they've just driven off. I mean, we haven't done anything wrong. All we've done is gone to a house and asked if we can speak to someone. They said no, so we drove away. Location 19, King George Pub, 11.46 a.m. Zero dead, one injured, three witnesses. The Eskdale witnesses have been less easy to track down and also less accommodating. Right, it's like drawing teeth trying to get a statement out of people who witnessed things after sea scale. It really has. Uh, one guy who I was told was a really, really nice fella. Uh, I've just tried to ring him up and uh, his missus has said, under no circumstances does he want to speak to you. It's really strange. It's as if they've been spoken to, I would suggest. Now, right, I've just knocked on Ronald Fazaklia's door and spoke to his wife. He wasn't in. He was the witness. And... Um, she said that he didn't think he would want to talk about it and I explained the anomalies and the fact that there's been witnesses report a different man and this kind of thing but she said she said oh it, w it was the man and I said did you see the gunman and she said no 
So she thinks she knows who it is, and she hasn't even seen the gunman. Um, so I, I was very polite to her, and I've said to her, look, all I'm after is a description of the vehicle and possibly a description of the gunman. That's it. I'm not after any gory details or anything like that. And then she said, oh, well, yeah, he did come past here because the police told us. So I said to her, well, the police tell lies. Um, if you didn't see it, then how do you know it happened? And um, this is the problem with this case, is people are citing what they've read or seen on TV. It's really difficult when you're trying to get witnesses to speak to you, especially when it's such a sensitive subject, because if they say no, you can't, you cannot then come back at them and say, well, why are you saying no? You can't get into an argument with them, because that is kind of harassment. So, as soon as they say no, that's it. You can, you, the door's closed, like. Now, some of the witnesses are not home, and in order to save me traipsing around their properties again and again, because it is quite a widespread area, I, I'm going to telephone them, because I have got the numbers of one or two of them. Welcome to PG Answer 157. Sorry, this mailbox is full. That's those two tried. Hello, can I speak to Barbara, please? Hi Barbara, um, I sent you a letter and DVD in the post about a week ago about the events in 2010 yes. with the unfortunate shootings. Yes. Um, are, are you okay to answer a question or two? Well, we didn't really see anything to be honest with you. Welcome to PG Answer 1571. Welcome to PG Answer 1571. Hello, can I speak to Leslie please? Sorry? Can I speak to Leslie? Leslie? My name's Richard, Richard Hall. Yeah. Uh, do you, any, any idea what time should be back? Uh, who, who are you, Richard Hall? I'm sorry, you've got the wrong number. Oh, uh, wrong number. Sorry about that. Please leave a message after the tone. All we need is a witness after the uh, Michael Pike shooting to see if we've got Derek Bird or we've got this possible imposter. It's amazing the different responses you get. Here's a passing place here. Um, that woman who lived in this great big house, really nice. She was sort of very friendly. She came out, on, out the, onto the, uh, into the garden. She says, oh, you're, you're investigating that, right? Well, I know two people who uh, witnessed that. There's um, the chap that you're talking about, and there's also a woman who lives up the road there as well. I said, really? I said, well, I'll go and speak to this chap first. Went to him, he wasn't in. Came back, knocked on the door, and I was expecting the same woman to answer the door. But a guy answers the door, and he's all um, just telling me to go away. It's a fairly straightforward thing I'm trying to establish. What was the description of the gunman? I said, I'm driving, driving along in this vehicle here. So I pull up, someone's by the side of the road. I ask them to come over to, to, for the time, and then I, I shoot them in the head, and they're dead. And I drive off. Who, who's going to see me do it? Who's going to see my face? No one. Um, now, once or twice, he, he is alleged to have got out of his vehicle to shoot people. But even then, until you've heard the gunshot, you're not alerted to it. And by the time you fired the gun, it's over and, and the, the perpetrator is on his way. So, it, we've got no CCTV footage of Derek Bird with a gun in his hand, walking down the street or shooting anyone. Nothing. We've got a handful of witnesses, a handful, who claim to have seen Derek Bird. And then at Cumbria, we've got a witness who's saying it's a man in his 20s with short dark hair. We need more witnesses. My feeling is that, that at least some of it was done by Derek Bird and he's been taken out. Oh, he's a motorbike. He's been taken out by an operative, murdered.
um, the operatives driven the cart into the woods. Dumped his body. In a statement read out to the Workington Court, the victim, Miss Moretta, said, I just thought he was going to ask me directions, so I put my head in towards his vehicle as I couldn't see properly because the sun was glaring off the windscreen. The passenger side window was missing or wound right down and the quarter light window was shattered. At this point I looked at the man. He looked at me with such a blank expression on his face. He never said a word to me. Then I saw him with his left hand just lift from his handbrake area a gun. He pointed it at my face and I just pulled back and turned to run. I then felt this almighty thump. It was like I had been hit really hard on my face. I then just ran off holding my face, screaming and waving my arms down the road. We get no physical description of the gunman, but again, the witness says, such a blank expression on his face. Location 20, Sims Travel, 11.50 a.m. Zero dead, zero injured, one witness. Mr. Preston said, he shot the rifle at us and we were in total shock because you don't expect it. We didn't know where the bullet might have gone. The taxi then drove away. Location 21, Dalegarth Station, 11.53 a.m. Zero dead, zero injured, one witness. Christine Alty survived another execution attempt after being beckoned over to Bird's car. The shot missed her, but she remembers a sudden loud bang and a whoosh of air past her face. Location 22, Holland's Campsite, 11.55 a.m. Zero dead, one injured, one witness. At 11.55 a.m., Nathan Jones and Philip Moore were leaving the Holland's campsite with a dog. Bird shot Jones in the face and he had a 2-2 bullet lodged in his right cheek, but survived. Location 23, after Holland's campsite, 11.57 a.m. Zero dead, one injured, six witnesses. At 11.57 a.m., Samantha Christie and her boyfriend, Craig Ross, pulled over so she could take a photograph. As Bird drove by, he asked, Are you having a nice day? Before she could reply, he opened fire, inflicting multiple injuries to her jaw, palate and eye socket. Mr. Ross began running to her aid, but stopped when Bird ordered him to get back into the couple's car and drive away. As he did so, the killer fired a parting shot and shattered his rear screen. Motorist Carlton Watts, who had his wing mirror clipped by the taxi, described Bird as driving like a crazy person. He added, his eyes were bulging and he was fixated, and I thought, this guy is a nutter, I'm going to get out of here. Location 24, Doctors Bridge, Noon. One dead, which was Derek Bird, zero injured, and two or three witnesses. We come now to the final scene, which raises yet more questions. The Telegraph newspaper reported, Jonathan Wilkinson was with his girlfriend and parents in the isolated village of Boot in Cumbria when Bird's silver Citroen Picasso shot past him, denting the side of his car. Furious with the driver, Mr. Wilkinson chased him, determined to note down his registration plate details. However, when he caught up with the car, the driver had vanished. Bird had abandoned the vehicle and set off on foot before killing himself in nearby woodland last Wednesday. Mr. Wilkinson, 30, had no idea that the man he was following had just killed 12 people and injured 11 others on a three-hour rampage across the country. I thought he was a hit-and-run driver, and I thought I should get down the registration plate and his details, he told the son. He was about 160 yards ahead of me. The car was weaving all over the place, and because one tyre had gone, he was driving on the rim. Mr. Wilkinson started taking photographs of the vehicle before he noticed that the front windows had been smashed in and there were rifle cartridges on the front seat. The first photographs I took were of the back of the car and the license plate. As I made my way to the front, I saw a hole in the window and live bullets scattered across part of the dashboard and in the footwell of the car. When I saw those, the survival instinct kicked in and I just started running back as fast as I could. Now I think I must have been the last person to see him alive. There are two more witnesses to the gunman abandoning the vehicle, but these other witnesses do not mention seeing Jonathan Wilkinson, and Jonathan Wilkinson does not mention seeing them. The other witnesses were Zoe and Lee Turner, who it is alleged were the last people to see Bird alive and were featured in a very detailed article in Mail Online. The article states, Staring straight ahead, vacant and glassy-eyed, Cumbrian killer Derek Bird stood in the quiet country lane with a large 2-2 hunting rifle held across his body in both hands.
By his side was his damaged car, its front tyre shredded, passenger window shattered by gunfire and empty cartridge shells littering the floor. Facing him, and frozen with fear, Zoe Turner took in the incongruous scene in the idyllic Lake District Valley and thought only of her two sons playing yards away. Looking her straight in the eye, the man who minutes earlier had shot his final victim in the face, seemingly at random, appeared to make his decision. But when Bird spoke just three words, it was to offer her reassurance. You're all right, he muttered, gruff and emotionless, before walking off, crossing a stone humpbacked bridge over a small stream and disappearing. This article doesn't say that Zoe and Lee Turner saw a man taking photographs of the vehicle. Now I don't have time to read this very long article, which features an image of the gunman's vehicle with what looks like a taxi sign on top of it. I telephoned Lee Turner and spoke to him on the phone and asked him about what he witnessed. He described the gunman as being very red in the face, short, overweight and balding. I asked him when the photographs in the article were taken. He then went online to look at the Mail Online article in order to answer that question. He stated that this photograph was taken about a minute before the gunman crashed his car, but couldn't remember when this one was taken. He said, ah, oh, it can't have been taken that day because uh, I've got different clothes on, and said it was probably taken on that holiday, but he couldn't remember when. I got the impression that it may have been taken specifically for this news article, but perhaps he didn't want to admit that to me. He also said the official time of the gunman crashing his car, at one minute past twelve, he knew to be incorrect because of what he knows to be true. I asked Lee Turner if he could remember a taxi sign on top of the vehicle. He replied no, but that where a taxi sign would be, there were bits of yellow tape. No previous witness has mentioned there being bits of yellow tape on the roof of the car. This article looks like an attempt by mainstream media to dot the I's and cross the T's for the public. It's all over now, nothing more to see, get on with your lives. Let's just discuss some of what happened. There does seem to be some discrepancies between this idea of him being in like a, you know, in essentially a psychopathic rage, gone postal, or for want of a better expression. Uh, the, the concept that again it's a kind of a Hollywood thing of this person that's so furious and so driven that he's just going to do this until such time that, that the red mist clears which seems completely separate from the descriptions of him being incredibly calm he doesn't appear to be acting in a frenzy he, he, he's quite calm in the manner in which he, he pulls people over to the car and such like that the mainstream story seems to be two types of killer which would be a spree killer and somebody that's got a specific point, like a vendetta type killer. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think those two are the, are the same. And I don't know as the actions that would create that are the same. There are some discrepancies that would suggest to me that perhaps you've got a scenario where you've got multiple shooters and actually multiple cars as well. It would seem that perhaps a couple of these cars are perhaps similar in order to cause that confusion. The first murder for which there were no witnesses was that of Derek Bird's twin brother and took place around 5 a.m. This was followed by a five-hour gap before the remaining 11 murders occurred, taking place more or less consecutively between 10.13 a.m. and finishing at around 11.30 a.m. I am not aware of any hard evidence that Derek Bird perpetrated the first murder, that of his own brother. A week previous, David and his brother Derek were up at the local scramble track with a, an off-road vehicle that David had just finished making and they spent quite a bit of time that afternoon driving round and round laughing their heads off like you would expect warm brothers to do. And I would ask what could be the reason for a five-hour gap between the first two murders? Is it possible this time period was used to turn Derek Bird into a patsy using the techniques described by Neil Sanders? One of the first things that um, Alan Dulles said when he was starting the MK Ultra program was we want to find the conditions whereby we can take somebody off and in the space of say half an hour we can hypnotize them or cause some sort of thing which would make them say crash a plane or crash a car. Family puts no blame on Derek. They knew Derek for 52 years. There was a new Derek for a few hours of last Wednesday and the two things were very separate in the, in the minds and memories of the family. 
mean how controllable this person would be as an entity whether you would require another shooter I don't know it very much depends there are there are psychotronic weapons that can put voices into people's heads and essentially turn people schizophrenic again whilst that might um, give you a result I don't know how controllable that would be as a, as a sort of murder tool I've highlighted some anomalies which suggest that more than just Derek Bird may have been involved in what happened. I've also shown witness statements which suggest that Bird may have been under some kind of mind control. However, I don't want to use guesswork to come up with a scenario on what may have really happened because I still don't have enough evidence to create a hypothesis. Simply to say, there are enough holes in this evidence to warrant reopening this case and an external new team re-interviewing all the witnesses to find out what really happened. The Thornhill events are particularly puzzling and I'd be interested to know if anyone has suggestions for a scenario that fits all the evidence. If this was a conspiracy with operatives involved, one has to consider that the senior police investigating officer and the coroner could be involved to some degree even if it was just making sure the outcome of the inquest matched what had already been put out in mainstream media. It's a safe bet they are both senior Freemasons. An inquest is different to a trial in that we do not have a lawyer defending Derek Bird. All the evidence put before the jury is decided by the coroner and not put forward by a defence lawyer. Therefore, any evidence which contradicts an official line could in theory be left out by the coroner there would be no one to challenge this if it happened. What I am saying is an inquest is much easier to fix than a trial. I would ask the question, was Derek Bird murdered in order to ensure this would be run as an inquest and not as a trial, and also to silence the patsy? At this stage it is pertinent also to point some things out I noticed about the inquest. We have a case involving 12 murders and 11 serious injuries at 24 crime scenes. Throughout the entire inquest, one senior officer, Detective Superintendent Andy Slattery, gave testimony on all the incidents. Although some junior police officers did give statements on individual incidents, Slattery was clearly the voice presenting the views of Cumbria Police, covering the whole case, giving evidence for every single incident. It appears that most of the information coming from the police to the inquest was being handled by Slattery. Between Coroner Roberts and Detective Superintendent Slattery, it would have been quite straightforward for them to manipulate the verdict of the inquest by ensuring the jury did not see any evidence which contradicts the official story. I am not saying this is what happened, just exploring it as a possibility. Out of the 90 or so first-hand witnesses, less than 30 attended the inquest in person. The vast majority of witnesses received the letter saying they would not be required to attend and their statements would be read out. Having looked at some of the evidence I have so far been able to uncover, it's not clear to me what happened that day, and it seems possible that people other than Derek Bird may have been involved in these murders. Let's now come on to the issue of motives. To establish a motive, one needs to know what happened, how it happened, and who was responsible. In other words, we need to know who the true perpetrator or perpetrators were. There are two clear scenarios to consider. One, the perpetrator was Derek Bird acting alone. And scenario two, those responsible were persons other than Derek Bird and Derek Bird was a patsy. If we first go down scenario one, that Derek Bird was solely responsible, there are a number of possible motives that have been put forward, mainly by mainstream media, as the reason for his drastic actions. In fact, the sheer number of motives put forward by the media suggest that no single strong motive exists. Here is a list of the suggested motives I have learned about, largely put out by mainstream media. I will state also that I don't know if they are all true. 1. Derek Bird fell in love with a woman from Thailand three years previous and sent her £1,000. She then asked him not to contact him anymore and he was upset over this. 2. Derek Bird was in a dispute over his father's will because of money given to his twin brother. Derek Bird's father died in 1998. That's a long time to wait before getting upset. 3. In 1990, he resigned from his job at Sellafield because he was facing disciplinary proceedings over allegations that he stole some wood. 
even longer time to wait before getting upset. 4. Derek Bird was in debt. This is untrue. He had savings of £22,000. 5. Derek Bird had avoided paying tax. This is also untrue. He was on a low income and claiming tax credits, therefore was not liable for income tax. 6. Derek Bird was being investigated for tax evasion. This is untrue. He had just completed a bog standard tax credits check, which he passed. The Inland Revenue then requested a bog standard tax inspection, which was in the process of being carried out. He was not subject to any criminal investigation or prosecution by the Inland Revenue. 7. Derek Bird had been involved in disputes with other taxi drivers over queue jumping at the rank. 8. Derek Bird had a minor scuffle while out drinking in Whitehaven. 9. Darren Rowcastle threw some milk in the boot of Derek Bird's car. 10. Other taxi drivers were jealous of Derek Bird because he was self-employed. And so on and so on and so on. I will also mention here Detective Chief Superintendent Ian Goulding, who at the inquest in his statements spouted a great deal of what sounded like unsubstantiated hearsay concerning Derek Bird's frame of mind. My officers and I are absolutely determined to get to the bottom of why this happened. However, it may not be possible to establish all the answers because we cannot speak to Derek Bird. He is alleged to have said that Bird arranged a meeting with Kevin Commons to discuss his finances. He said that Bird had been worried for some time about his involvement with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs or with tax payments and he had developed irrational fears of prison. The fears were made worse by the belief that his brother and solicitor were conspiring against him. Now Goulding would not have been allowed to say these words at a trial, but because this was an inquest where a coroner can admit hearsay evidence, he was allowed to say them. Just consider this, the comments by Goulding are about Derek Bird, who is dead, Kevin Commons, who is dead, and David Bird, who is dead. How the hell would Goulding know all this when all three people he is referring to are dead? It seems to me that Goulding took advantage of the fact that dead men can't talk and took advantage of the fact that hearsay is permitted at an inquest. What an utter disgrace that Goulding was actually allowed to spout these words without a single shred of proof. To my knowledge, there is no evidence of any of these claims other than Bird arranging a meeting with Kevin Commons, who was a family friend. The media, of course, just spouted Goulding's hearsay as if it were gospel. None of the motives put forward are likely to have caused a peaceful, quiet man with no history of violence to go and murder 12 people in cold blood. People say it was a combination of these factors which pushed him over the edge. If you really believe that, I suggest you have been watching too much television. Now let's look at scenario 2. If the real perpetrator was not Derek Bird, then the motive cannot be established by looking at Derek Bird or looking at the life of Derek Bird. It can only be established by looking at the victims and asking the question, could there have been a strong motive, probably by a powerful group or person, to murder at least one of the victims on Derek Bird's hit list? It took me about 10 minutes and I didn't have to look very far to discover a very strong motive to murder Derek Bird's second victim, solicitor Kevin Commons, which will take a little bit of explaining. Six months before the Cumbria massacre, West Cumbria suffered severe flooding, which damaged hundreds of properties and caused one death. The flooding was caused because Thirlmere Reservoir overflowed due to heavy rainfall. But we need to go back to 2005 to explain this story fully. This internet article points out that in 2005 both Keswick and Cockermouth were flooded because when the above average rainfall filled Thirlmere to overflowing, the excess water turned the river Greta into a raging torrent. Apparently in 2005 United Utilities, which owns Thirlmere Reservoir, was first asked to lower the water level during the autumn so that there was additional capacity to hold the winter rains coming off the Lake District fells. The private company refused to do so, claiming that its priority was to keep the reservoir full to the brim so that it could provide the necessary water to meet the needs of 300,000 homes in Greater Manchester. But in November 2009, heavy rainfall caused Thirlmere to overflow yet again. 
The result this time was that not only were Keswick and Cockermouth flooded again, but also the main north side bridge in Workington was swept away and PC Bill Barker lost his life, preventing a major disaster by stopping cars from crossing the bridge. Again, prior to the disaster, Thirlmere Reservoir was full to the brim. This time, to make the problem worse, work was being carried out on the Manchester Aqueduct, restricting the amount of water making its way down to the city, which meant the reservoir was overflowing even before the heavy rains of November the 19th. If the water level in Thirlmere had been three metres below the reservoir wall, as was called for back in 2005, then this disaster wouldn't have happened because the abnormal rainfall would have been easily absorbed. There is no doubt that the high water level in Thirlmere was responsible for the devastation caused in Workington and Cockermouth. Now, Kevin Commons, who was the boss of Kevin Commons solicitors, was in the process of trying to sue United Utilities for causing the floods. This was a massive legal case, potentially worth millions of pounds, and as mentioned, it involved the death of a police officer. This news article explains that Kevin Commons contacted 150 people affected by the floods. It states, all are interested in joining a mass legal action for compensation. This is a letter I have obtained, written by Kevin Commons solicitors to United Utilities, pointing out the possibility that United Utilities could be to blame, and inviting United Utilities to make a pre-action disclosure, asking them for flood prevention plans, reports and recommendations made to the company by supervising engineers, maintenance records, water level records, and information about when pumps were switched on and off, etc., etc. I spoke about this in 2014. Suffice to say that if Kevin Commons' action had been successful, perhaps the directors of United Utilities would have ended up in prison. This hypothesis becomes more interesting when one realises that the two most senior executives at United Utilities both resigned around the time of the Cumbrian shootings. The legal action was taken over by Marcus Nixon. Marcus Nixon was investigated for fraud in 2013 and eventually the legal action was dropped. So imagine what might have happened to United Utilities and their bosses if Kevin Commons had not been murdered by Derek Bird. In my opinion, this seems a far more likely motive for murder than the ones attributed to Derek Bird. And in saying this, I am not accusing anyone at United Utilities. How well respected was Kevin Commons in the community? Oh, enormously. I mean, Kevin uh, used to be a court clerk here in Workington uh, and decided to uh, set up his own business 23 or 24 years ago, I think it is now, and started from scratch and, and built it into a, a very uh, big and successful business. And um, he, he was a very much larger in life figure. Uh, and uh, it's difficult to believe that, you know, a man of his stature, both uh, in uh, physical terms, but also in, in his reputation terms, is no longer with us. I suppose it's a sign of his commitment to his profession that he didn't retire. Yes, it is. I mean, uh, Kevin turned 60 towards the end of last year, uh, a time when people think about retirement. Um, but uh, he very much was somebody who cared passionately about the criminal justice system and, and, uh, and working as a defence advocate for all those years. Uh, he wanted to carry on doing that um, and, and did right up until the day of his death. Have you any sense yet whether Kevin Commons was a, a particular target for this killing? I've no... Uh, information I could give about that because that would be subject to the police investigation. Perhaps by murdering 11 more people instead of just the one target might have been done to hide the real motive and hide the real target. History of American serial killers where it would appear that one or two were hits, say political assassinations for example, and they are disguised by putting them into the milieu of, oh, this is a random set of killings and such like that. So, in theory, you could suggest that maybe like the lawyer or perhaps any of the witnesses could have been, had some sort of uh, other explanation behind it that we, do, we don't know about. This might seem unbelievably ruthless and beyond comprehension for some of you, but I can assure you there are people in this world capable of such acts and much worse. Perhaps Derek Bird's reason for meeting with Kevin Commons was not to discuss his finances, but perhaps to discuss flood damage compensation. Derek Bird's 83-year-old mother lived in one of the villages that was affected by the floods. 
Before we wrap up, let's just make a few observations about mainstream media and their coverage of the events that day. The first the police knew of the shootings was at 13 minutes past 10 by a phone call from Susan Rooney. At 11am the police posted a message on their public website reporting on shots being fired by a man in Whitehaven. Not until 2pm did police report on their website that they were apprehending a man near Boot in Cumbria. BBC Look North, who normally broadcast their programmes from a studio in Newcastle, a hundred miles away and a two and a quarter hour drive from where the events took place, decided to present and broadcast their entire early evening news programme live from Whitehaven. In order to get camera crews and newscasters to Whitehaven ready to go on air by 5.30pm, the staff, who would have been expecting to be working from the studio in Newcastle, must have been told very soon they were to get over to Whitehaven to film the show there. So somebody at the BBC made this decision very early. I would ask, does this show some kind of pre-knowledge of what was going to happen that day? And once they started their broadcast, the case was closed from word go, within just a few hours of the murders of 12 people, spread over a massive area of countryside, our media had it all wrapped up. A lone madman, acting independently of anyone else, had gone on the rampage with guns, end of story. The only question to be asked by them was why would a man do this, jumping straight to the motive before they've examined any evidence of what may or may not have happened putting into the public's mind a narrative before any real investigation had taken place. In addition to this disgraceful journalism, just listen to the tone of the presenters' voices and their attitudes in these clips. Carol Melia is almost gloating to the camera, possibly because she knows this is a chance to shine on national TV. That he had taken his own life. Well, our chief reporter, Chris Stewart, has been following events. Well, our chief reporter, Chris Stewart, has been following events all day here in Whitehaven. Chris, just give us a sense of some of the terror that must have been occurring here today. It's been an extraordinary and a dreadful day. We were here, we were probably the first television crew here, and when we got here it was, it was very odd because we were right next to the scene where the man was found dead this morning. At that time we were told one person had been killed. That very quickly became two. The police didn't confirm anything, um, and then we had, we got to Prime Minister's questions time, and, and, and David Cameron said five people had been killed. Now, at that time, I'd actually been told that the figure was more than five, and sadly, that figure turned out to be correct. Twelve people dead, and the gunman as well. Hey, this is Whitehaven. Things like this just don't happen here. It really is such a shock. With the police closing in, he shot himself in these woods in the tiny beauty spot of Boot. I hope I have illustrated that police investigations and our justice system need to be more transparent. My wish is for this case to be reopened and reinvestigated by somebody other than Cumbria Police and the Coroner's Office. This investigation should re-interview all the witnesses and also publish all the CCTV evidence which has been hidden. I will leave you with the words of taxi driver and victim Paul Wilson, whose comments, if taken literally, may well just be true. The guy that shot me, the guy that's done you know, these 12 murders and his own suicide, the guy who's injured all these people, the guy who's basically just dramatically changed his community, isn't the guy that I know, isn't the friend that I know, isn't the colleague that I know. <laughs>